Good evening. Welcome to Meet the Artist. My name is Diana Suttle. I'm an art consultant and curator. At one time, you said something to me that has always uh, stuck in my mind. Uh, you said that good artwork or great artwork should always put one in a state of awe. Can you elaborate on that, please? Well, yes. Uh, that statement comes from a context uh, that has to do with what is the proper function of art. You know, art in the service of what? And uh, the proper function of art is not to be in the service of something that creates a reference to anything outside of the frame of art. And what that means is, for instance, uh, art should not create desire. For instance, uh, you have a picture of a lovely uh, children playing on the beach, and you say, isn't that lovely? I would love to be on that beach with those children. That's desire. Uh, you have a picture of a guy driving a Mustang convertible, and he sees a lovely girl on the corner, and you think, oh, I'd like to buy that Mustang and meet a girl like that. That's desire. Uh, you could say that all advertising art is in the service of desire. Advertising is, in a sense, pornography. Mm -hmm. The other idea is that art evokes movement in the other direction, a way you re you're recoiled, you're uh, frightened by it, you're di disgusted by it, you're reviled by it. Uh, this is also movement outside of the frame of reference of the art. Uh, so the proper function of art, then, is to hold you in a state of aesthetic arrest. Because when you're moved to desire or to loathing or fear, you're here in the world. And the proper function of art should be to take you beyond the temporal experience mm -hmm. and hold you in a state of awe as you said, where there is the possibility of being in a state of awe in relation to the radiance of the art. Mm -hmm. uh, you are the universal subject, and your eyes are beholding the universal object. And the radiance of the object comes through. And wow, you know, what an experience. And that's the aesthetic experience. And, and that's, that's really the uh, meaning behind that statement. Oh, OK. I know that that has always been in my mind. I can always remember you saying that. And it has a great influence on me when I look at a painting. Um, but I feel, by observing your, at, by observing your artwork, um, that your approach is quite intellectual in that you integrate different scientific theories with a very meticulous and sometimes structural or chaotic line, depending upon the energy of the painting. Um, your work, to me, is always a constant reminder of mankind's greatness and the human pursuit of spirituality. Um, I, I'm just curious, what exactly or who exactly inspired you to become an artist? Well, I've been naturally uh, drawn to art ever since I was a child. So it, it was maybe innate? It's, it's, it's completely innate, uh -huh. you know. Uh, and uh, I don't know why. I was 10 years old. I came to America, and I just loved abstract art. And I wanted to see uh, Jackson Pollock and all the abstract artists. And, and I loved jazz music. And uh, so I think that part of it is just my nature. It's just my makeup. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, of course, uh, p the inspiration comes from, you know, the natural part of myself. But in addition to that, it comes from uh, I wanted to make art, and what kind of art do I want to make? And I wanted to understand. I wanted to get this very clear in my mind. Uh, what kind of art should an artist make? What kind of uh, usefulness for making art is there in, in the world? And uh, I had to find, of course, the motivation 
and the passion in the kind of art I make that would keep me going, mm -hmm. that, that could sustain my commitment to it. Mm -hmm. and, and I found that by learning to understand the underlying spiritual value of art. And uh, in my uh, studies and research, uh, I found that many artists throughout history had this link. Uh, painters, dancers, uh, and of course, it links back even further than that. It links back to prehistoric times. It links back to the times when all art was mythological. All art was spiritual. Mm -hmm. And art was not for decoration, nor was it for sale. It is a shared experience of the community, mm -hmm. and the art speaks for the value system and the belief system by which the community lives. It's not something they just think about. They actually live by this. App. And when I found that connection uh, for myself in my art, uh, it gave it the kind of meaning that allowed me to continue with a uh, uh, passion. Okay. Thanks for answering. I, I always wondered about that. You've described your work as, quote, symbolic paintings that represent the new mythology for a scientific age. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? Well, uh, once having discovered my relationship and understanding and appreciation of the uh, mythic element mm -hmm. uh, in art historically mm -hmm. throughout human history, mm -hmm. uh, I realized that the mythologies, you know, are metaphors. Uh, the paintings are metaphors. A metaphor is, you know, stands for something that is the same as. Mm -hmm. uh, mythological metaphors are the belief systems. For instance, all religions are metaphors. Dreams are metaphors. I mean, you wouldn't interpret a dream literally. Mm -hmm. uh, you, we've all come to understand that a dream is a symbolic imagery. Dreams, as well as mythology, come from the human collective unconscious. Uh, and it's only of value when it is representative of the collective, mm -hmm. not the personal. Uh, the personal has nothing to do with it. Uh, whatever you do has to relate to the human experience, the collective human experience, not personal statements. And so uh, artists have been the makers of mythic images throughout human history. And today, in modern contemporary society, where we have no mythology, if you take the spiritual, the mystical element out of mythology, what you have left is ideology. And that's what we have all over the world today, ideology, ideological interpretations of symbolic ideas that stand for something else, but they're being read as signs, not as symbols. They're being taken in the denotative context rather than the connotative meaning. Mm -hmm. And people are dying. And it's, it's a bizarre and frightening aspect of uh, the world today. Mm -hmm. And uh, so artists, I think, are the people who can uh, connect get in touch with eternal truths mm -hmm. uh, that are common to the context of all human experience that represent the collective unconscious experience and bring that through in a contemporary idiom and to, to create the kind of imagery that can speak of eternal truths to contemporary society in, in the current context in which we live. Well, with that said, uh, what is there a particular process that you go through before you start a painting? Well, to, to... And there is, and uh, of course, the pro on the one hand, you could say the process continues with me all the time. It's uh -huh. part of my daily life. But when I prepare to do work, of course, clearing the mind is very important. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, uh, you know, I take time. Uh, to just to be in my environment, my workspace, and uh, to, uh, you know, rid myself 
of the concerns of uh, the job and the mm -hmm. other activities of the day of the world sure. and to get in touch and uh, and uh, that's you know reaching the the silence within you know there is a point value of inner sounds where people who talk a lot mm -hmm. can't hear others and people who are always talking to themselves can't hear themselves and so this idea of silence is to quiet down the spontaneous mind stuff and get in touch with that part of yourself where you can hear yourself and if you hear yourself you will also hear the universal creative uh, field resonating within you mm -hmm. and so that's the process well you know your your ideas your philosophy is always has always been so fascinating to me and I'm, I'm just very curious um, with the way that you think um, exactly what what do you feel is going on in the contemporary art world today well um, what do you think needs to, to yeah, be changed what of, direction do well, you feel that's going in well I I feel it's certainly not going in the direction that I perceive uh -huh. uh, although there are individuals in the art world who are addressing these issues they're aware of them uh, but they're not getting any recognition mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, but of course you know I'm against any form of censorship mm -hmm. uh, I want to say that and I don't think there should be anyone or anything that dictates what art is or can be uh, but with no censorship shouldn't there be a sense of responsibility well I think there should be a sense of awareness okay. of the transformations of human consciousness mm -hmm. which are taking place at many levels mm -hmm. and uh, I think uh, you know part of the problem is that artists today go to college you know they go to a university and mm -hmm. they take psychology classes and sociology classes and environmental classes and so on and uh, I think a lot of uh, p people come out of the universities as artists and they think well you know if I align myself with one of these social based movements uh -huh. or issues then uh, of course the issue is important so if I make art about it my art will also be important mm -hmm. but of course it's not really uh, creating a transforming experience uh, for the anyone who sees the art or for society yet um, <clears throat> and uh, so that's what we have you know we have really merely a, re a reflection of the temporal experience rather than uh, any doors or windows being open to a transcendent mm -hmm. awareness or experience artists are like mystics except the mystic doesn't have a craft Mm -hmm. and our craft holds us to the world mm -hmm. uh, a mystic goes off in his psyche to mm -hmm. some experience mm -hmm. and that's where he goes and often it's where he stays mm -hmm. uh, the artist has to bring this something back to the studio and then through the practice of his craft the artist has to learn to refine their own inner sensibilities mm -hmm. and uh, and you have to refine your own spirit so to speak mm -hmm. it's almost like an internal cleansing process by which you uh, come to terms with whatever mystical experience you may have had so it's a psychological journey kind of like a hero's journey you go off beyond the boundaries of your society uh, beyond the edge and you experience something and you bring something back and then now you have to work in your studio with your craft and uh, present it to the world and make it visible in some way to the world and and I think that's the deepest application of art I think hmm. I read a review about an artist whose work I thought was great and, and the reviewer said the work seems too positive for our times uh, it's really interesting that at a time in the world when we've reached maximum capabilities in technologically scientifically uh, economically materially that people are running around depressed and uh, I think it's because the mythological guidelines
for how to live a meaningful life are absent. We have ideology. Yes, th that ties in very well with my my next thought. Actually, I, I you know I. You know, there are many great contemporary artists that I very much admire, but so often I come across artists who produce nothing but depressing and disturbing work. It seems to be an undying trend in the contemporary art world. Do you feel the same way? Yeah, it, well, I not only, un, unfortunately, it's undying, although in many ways I think it's already dead. Mm -hmm. I mean, the avant garde, in my opinion, is finished. Mm -hmm. The avant garde is over, mm -hmm. it, it died from sheer exhaustion. <laughs> uh, Marcel Duchamp was basically the first artist who realized, you know, I can gain recognition and bring attention to myself as an artist, not by making great art, but merely by making an avant-garde statement, like putting a urinal in the museum and calling it a fountain. Mm -hmm. And that kind of set a trend in motion. And of course, the first few people who did it, it was unique, it was different, it uh, created a kind of intellectual a consideration about what art could be or should be, and, and that was kind of fun, but it's exhausted. But what we have, again, is the universities, generation after generation of uh, art instructors and professors teaching what they learned, who were taught what their, their professors learned. And so it's a continuum, and no one has stopped to question it. And it's very interesting to me because I realize that starvation, war, bigotry, violence is an ever-present part of the world that we live in. But I often wonder if it's always necessary to make those uh, factors the main focus in the art society. So why isn't it sort of redundant for an artist to what? be new, to to be talking about the same thing when I feel that an, I, I personally feel that an artist should. Yeah. put uh, humankind on a, on a higher level, you know? Yeah, well, precisely. It's not only redundant, uh -huh. but again, it's uh, art that is in the service of something else. If yeah. you want to do journalism about yes. the human condition, that's fine. Mm -hmm. uh, by the way, violence and war and poverty and all of that has been with us for at least three million mm -hmm. years that mm -hmm. we know about. Mm -hmm. It's not likely to go away mm -hmm. unless society... Uh, transforms its consciousness. Mm -hmm. And I know that some artists believe that by presenting these images, uh, this will somehow have a transforming effect on people, but it never has, because it, that's not what transforms people. It's a realization of a higher, greater force exactly. that's in our lives that brings people to a transformation of consciousness mm -hmm. uh, in uh, primal cultures, which have been very important for my studies, and in other historical ancient cultures, uh, you didn't show people what was bad about the culture. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, all the studies and that we have uh, done by anthropologists throughout the 19th and 20th century, ever since anthropology was a field, shows that when you take that away, when you take the magical belief away, and you push people into only a reality-based existence, the culture disintegrates. Right. But no one is addressing the potentiality for humankind. The potentiality is infinitely great and limitless. And that's what we have to connect to. So basically, what would you say, uh, or what do you think is the responsibility of an artist today? I mean, we, they, we, artists really do have a responsibility as, well, a, as a historian, in a sense, and, um, you know, artists yeah. make significant statements about our, our life and time. So what, how do you feel that, you know, what direction do you think the artists are taking today and what, how do they need, what, what do they need to do to change? Well, I, I think what we need to do is look at the positive opportunities that exist for humankind uh -huh. and to separate uh, ourselves from politics mm -hmm. and from socioeconomic conditions mm -hmm. and from temporal issues mm -hmm. and to find value in something deeper and more meaningful that can be brought to the world. Mm -hmm. I would say in a general sense, mm -hmm. that I see as being a more important responsibility for mm -hmm. artists. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So basically, would you say that would be, that's your legacy? That's well, the legacy it's certainly like what I 
try to do in my uh -huh. work. It's the passion that drives me. Uh -huh. uh, not because, but it's not because I say, oh, this is my responsibility, but rather because I see it very clearly. I see the positive potential for humanity. Of course, interestingly enough, and Einstein, of course, being you know my personal posthumous mentor, and uh, and uh, just a person I love. There are certain people historically that I just have feelings of love for. You know, mm -hmm. I, I moved from the heart, uh, and uh, and that includes you know prehistoric painters from twenty five thousand years ago. It includes contemporary painters like Pollock and Picasso. Uh, because I, I just uh, feel a heart connection with him. Uh, uh, Barnett Newman being one of my favorites. Uh, if he were alive, I'd want to hug him. You know, it's that kind of feeling. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but I, we're now, uh, two things have become very apparent in the world that have really moved all of this to a new paradigm shift. And that is, A, that the classical cultures uh, Bronze Age cultures, Eastern cultures, classical belief systems from thousands of years ago uh, are now being echoed by the most recent discoveries in physics, quantum mechanics, and fractal mathematics and chaos theory. And most of the discussion today about the positive potentiality for humanity is emanating from the scientific community. Uh, when I talk to other artists or listen to other artists, they're echoing all of the same kind of antisocial sentiments. Mm -hmm. And basically what I've come to feel is that they've learned this in school and to be part of the art group now, they have learned the art speak and then of course they make the art that reflects that and it's almost like a uh, self-serving, closed, self-reinforcing circle of sameness that, uh, that is not really infusing itself with new ideas, new opportunities, or new knowledge. We have to now bring our new understanding. Our consciousness is transformed by science. All the new knowledge and understanding of the universe comes from the scientific community. This is a trans transformation, you know, to transform, information, form is part of the word of information, part of the word of transformation. So it has to take a new form. And uh, the discoveries uh, are profound. The new science has really moved us into a complete new understanding. For instance, we have the new concept of the biomorphic field. Uh, Einstein is the one who established the concept of the field. The field pervades everything. It's invisible, it's energy, it influences everything that happens in the field. In other words, the whole universe is not only alive, it's evolving. And uh, we could say that the laws of the universe are evolving simultaneously and that we are evolving with the universe. In other words, if it's alive, it's evolving. And if it's evolving, it's changing. Mm -hmm. And uh, we are part of that product of the universe changing with it. And the real human potential and the real transformation of human consciousness lies in the understanding of that, this recognition of the interconnectedness and totality of all things. The new model is uh, that the universe is alive. And this is the Gaian principle coming back. This is. Uh, the earth goddess and now mm -hmm. the universal goddess of life mm -hmm. coming back. And everything is connected. And uh, the new paradigm is not to be in the know, but to be in the mystery. Mm. Because mm -hmm. the female goddess and the powers of the goddess, the mystique of the goddess, has always been associated with the mystery. Mm -hmm. You know, the male warriors were initiated by the goddess. The big initiation for male warriors among the ancient Greeks wasn't uh, to perform some heroic daring deed on the battlefield. No, it was go to, into Eleusis, into a mystery religion, where the goddess initiated you into the mystery. Mm -hmm. That's where the depth of understanding came from. Well, the deep waters and the waters and the lunar 
energies have, and the snake have always been associated with the mystery. It's in the mystery where we become initiated into the universe. Well, when one is in the mystery, then one is uh, uh, motivated to ask questions. And that's what all inventors do. And, and scientists and artists, whether you're a scientist or you're an artist, you're actually creating something, you're inventing something. Well, absolutely. I think uh, asking questions is the important function. Mm -hmm. And I think right now, uh, society, humanity, it needs to question our current worldview. Mm -hmm. Because any conditions, social, political, or otherwise, that we're experiencing in a negative way have to do with the fact that possibly we're stuck in, a, in an obsolete worldview. And uh, today, it's a global society. We are one humanity. I mean, the greatest image of the 20th century is a picture of the Earth floating in space taken from the moon. This is the real fact of our new existence. And of course, it's brought about some initiatives in the uh, environmental areas, you know, the recognition of the finite limitations of this small planet that we're clinging to. And uh, the worldview is the new mythology, and it has to include the new understanding. And I was uh, referring earlier to fields. You know, it started out with the uh, quantum field. Uh, Einstein saying everything is the field. Uh, he said that gravity warps space-time. In other words, forces are at work that configure the way the universe is made up. And uh, in the quantum field, you know, we're uh, talking about how particles behave. And uh, now we're discovering new fields, the biomorphic field, that there is a morphic resonance by which all living things are informed, just as the electrons are informed by the quantum field in their behavior. And we know that electrons have informational relationships to each other. And uh, so these are the kind of things physicists are recognizing and realizing that there is a informative, intelligent relationship between particles and the fields in which they exist. And that same relationship exists in the biomorphic field. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a uh, lecturer who was talking about a tree in his yard and a vine growing up the tree. And the vine grew on every branch. It just took over this tree except one branch. And he was sitting there looking at it thinking, he was disturbed by the lack of symmetry that that presented. And he was actually thinking of getting a ladder and climbing up there and threading the vine out onto that limb. And he says, as he was sitting there looking at it, suddenly the limb broke off. And he realized the vine knew. The vine knew that that limb was unstable. So if the vine knows that, see, that's consciousness, that's intelligence. What does the earth know about what's happening to it? And if the earth knows, what does the universe know? And so when nature, when the biomorphic field encounters an unstable relationship with its inhabitants, us humans, or with the process of life, you could say that the same intelligence or consciousness that told that vine not to grow on that branch is the same universal biomorphic resonance from the biofield that's guiding our consciousness, directing us to move away from unstable fields into more stable ones. And this implies then a direction for humanity. And you, since we know that our sun is going to supernova in another four or five billion years, universal consciousness knows this too. And the biomorphic field is informing us. And so what the Earth has done is it has brought forth a group of living beings, us, that can engineer and escape to avoid the inevitable supernova of the sun. So there are guiding principles, we realize, 
that pervade all of life and all of humanity. And what we have to do is align ourselves with that rather than bickering over, you know, uh, political boundaries or economic uh, dominance and things like that. And again, this brings forth the idea of the Gaian principle, the living earth, the living universe. So again, there's that relationship, you see. We're moving into the mystery. We do have to question our worldview, and we do have to adjust to the recognition of the new consciousness. Mm -hmm. And if there is a biomorphic field and a quantum field, there is also a creative intelligence field that is integral to that. And that creative intelligence field is what informs us. Design, you look all around the world, you see design. Everything is designed now. We live in artificial environments. Design is nothing more than the manifestation of human activity translating materials of the earth by being directed by universal creative intelligence from the living field, the morphic field of imagination, and then being brought forth. And now we're back to mythology and dreams, because when we're dreaming, the human unconscious is linked to universal imagination. Mm -hmm. We are part of the intent of this whole process of the universe, cooking and churning for billions of years. And then the earth churned its materials through vulca volcanism and plate tectonics and other forces, uh, global forces, and it produced life. Mm. And whose job is it now to churn stuff? It's ours. Mm -hmm. And that's what design and art is. We are taking the material now. We're taking to the next step. Mm. Where nature left off, and this is an apigenetic function. <clears throat> it's not genetically encoded. It is, in fact, the informative field of the imagination. When we're in deep dream, we're in touch, not only with our own unconscious, but the unconscious of the universe. It's almost as though the universe, when we're sleeping, is delivering information to us that will bring us back into accord Mm. with the proper directives and intentions mm -hmm. of where we are to go as a humanity. And I think for artists to hook up with that and, and begin to display and demonstrate a proper positive direction for humanity will inevitably bring a lot more benefits and results to society than to merely go out and say, well, look at the dirt in the street. Well, um, if you could select a painting that is in your current exhibition right now that would most accurately describe uh, the scientific and art re artistic relation relationship, uh, which one would it be? Yeah. Well, that's not an easy question to answer, but uh, I think I, I have some clues for you. Uh, of course, I do have one favorite painting, mm. but of course, each painting is like a chapter in a book. Mm -hmm. You know, they, uh, each painting expresses one aspect. But I do want to say this. I don't make paintings to explain science mm -hmm. to the public. Uh, I use science as a source of knowledge and understanding about the universe, mm -hmm. which I can then mystify and mythologize into art. Mm -hmm. It's the transformation of science through art, so to speak. Uh, my favorite painting, of course, is my self-portrait, but it's not because I'm depicting myself in it. I merely use myself as a device. This is the triptych. This is, is the big right. triptych uh -huh. because there uh, I'm extended mm -hmm. into both fields of duality, time and space. Uh -huh. uh, this is the field of the temporal. But only one eye is represented realistically. Uh, because it's of this world. Uh, the rest of my physical uh, being is represented as energy. So it expresses the, the idea of my understanding that I am energy, we are energy. Uh, I am not on one side or the other side of duality. I'm in the middle, but I'm extended into both fields. And in the painting, you can see the energy coming into me and it's being transformed at the heart level. Mm 
Mm. Uh, that's where we unify dualities at the heart level. That's where we transcend duality. And then uh, the one eye that's painted very realistically uh, suggests that I'm in this world, but not of it. Ah, I like that. So I like that. It brings the element of transcendence into it. So for uh -huh. me, uh, that painting came together in terms of it expressed many multiple levels of ideas that, I, that I've been uh, thinking about and working with. Uh, but of course, all the paintings, uh, I try to address some issue. But uh, we talked earlier about process of how I begin a painting. But the paintings themselves are expressions of process. Mm -hmm. uh, because, the, uh, again, the universe being a process, mm -hmm. it's unified field that is in process. This is the completely different view from the mechanistic Newtonian perception of that it's parts, individual parts, functioning in the context of a mechanistic, machine-like universe. No, it's a field that's in process. And I actually create paintings in response to a physical process. Uh, and many of the paintings, uh, you will see that there is a transformation of energy as it moves through material. And it uh, changes in that process. So the paintings themselves visually express some kind of process going on. And uh, so in that sense, I'm, I'm addressing our scientific understanding and relating it to the process of life itself. Mm -hmm. Why do you think your that your work would be a significant acquisition for an art collector? Well, gee, uh, I know that you're a little modest about well, that. Well, uh, and also but I mean, I'm, just, I'm you know. speaking to you know uh, <laughs> a part of uh, the art. Uh, you know, world that has to do with economics, which is not really uh, my area of expertise. But I do think, I really do believe, and I've worked very long uh, to uh, accomplish this, I really do believe that the work represents uh, the new paradigm shift in human consciousness. Mm -hmm. And I really do think that as we move on into the next decades, and into the 21st century that the recognition of this fact will become abundantly clear. And I think anyone who's in possession of one of the works will uh, be able to realize uh, not only the uh, spiritual and creative and artistic value of it, but uh, presumably, uh, according to market standards, some economic value. So, and I know that buyers and art consultants are most concerned with this because when you're telling someone to buy a work of art, they of course want to know well, you know, what's going to be the uh, value mm -hmm. uh, increase in this. You know, is it going to do better than the stock market? <laughs> is it going to mm -hmm. do better than my mutual fund? <laughs> and uh, and uh, I, I certainly wish them the best. You know, of course, although it's not, of course, at all a consideration in when I make art. Mm -hmm. But I do believe that if you make the right kind of art for the right time, that in, uh, invariably, inevitably, it will be of economic value as well. Because when I started painting full time, it was in 1977. And you know there were things going on in the art world. And I realized that you know, I don't want to do what everyone else is doing. Mm -hmm. uh, and I certainly don't want to play catch up. <laughs> and I felt that I wanted to take time to really clarify what I want my art to be. So I didn't shoot for the 80s. I didn't shoot for the 90s. Right from the beginning, in my oldest first journal notebook, I uh, was talking about making art for the 21st century. Because I sensed and felt, even then, very clearly, that the 21st century was going to be the conceptual age. And uh, it, as I uh, recently, I had just uh, been going through the journals to put some stuff on the internet, which everyone has to do now. And I realized that I, I was in the right direction right from the beginning, that many hmm. of the things I was talking about actually have come to fruition, and ah. they've become the fact. So there's been a lot of validation mm -hmm. of what I was thinking and doing along the way 
So uh, clearly, I, I feel I'm doing the right things at the right time. Well, one of the things that really, I think, sets my work apart, and this is also something that I initiated right from the beginning, is that I developed my own style. My work is completely original. It's not derivative. It's not in the manner of any other previous school or style of painting. And the ideas are completely original, too. I feel that I have really established and founded a whole new way of painting for the 21st century. And uh, I think that is one of the most important. And today, if you go around to galleries and you look at artwork, you will notice that there are almost no artists whose work is completely original in terms of style. That most artists today are working in the manner of something before. In fact, I've heard people say, uh, oh, you know, everything's been done. You can't really come up with anything new. And I disagreed with that idea right from the start. And I set out right from the beginning to establish my own style. And my own. in fact, I had to create a new style in order to speak to the ideas that I wanted to express. The two went hand in hand. And they evolved mutually. And I think the outcome speaks for itself. Well, a hundred years from now, when somebody is looking at one of your, your pieces, what, what would you like for that person to, to feel when they're looking at your work? What kind of questions would you like for that person to ask? Well, I would like them to feel like here truly is a work that was headed in the right direction mm -hmm. and understood where humanity was going. Mm -hmm. Well, I think 100 years from now, I think what people will recognize about my work is that I actually was very instrumental in establishing a completely new way of working for the 21st century. And when I say that, I don't think other artists are going to uh, imitate my style, necessarily. But I do think that they will begin to address the ideas that I address in my work. I believe that artists have to and will be pursuing the ideas that I've set down as the direction for art to move in in the 21st century. And I think that's what people will understand 100 years from now. And finally, how would you classify your work in the scope of art history? Well, uh, I, I would say that my work, uh, in some ways, I feel it's more linked to the paintings of the caves in France and Spain, that the impetus from which the work arises, I feel I share with those human beings, those Cro-Magnon, Homo sapiens sapiens, who are the first species in the evolution of the planet to make art. Uh -huh. uh, Cro-Magnons made art. This, so art is in and of itself a uh, evolutionary step forward. Mm -hmm for humanity, it, it's emblematic of this tr transition in human consciousness from making things that are purely functional to making things that speak of the divine radiance that pervades all of life. And I think our scientific knowledge and all of our human experiences since then have merely served to demonstrate the persistent existence of this divine radiance as being expressed in all of life, in all of us. And this is really the, what we need to celebrate. And I think to bring forth the radiance uh, through our work. You know, I don't, you know, Suzanne's apples are a good example of a kind of radiance. Yes. Uh, because they're not meant to be eaten. And uh, Suzanne said so himself. You know, someone said, uh, uh, he says, when I eat an apple, it's an a I see it as an apple. When I paint an apple, I see it as art. You know, he himself understood there's a distinction in perception and consciousness uh, in terms of what you're doing with it when it's art. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I think that's really, I would like to see people recognize the radiance in themselves, the radiance in their fellow human beings, the radiance in the world. I think that's the positive aspect that can bring humanity to a more meaningful 
and fulfilling way of life. Talk to you. Thank you for letting me go on at length. I know I have a tendency to talk <laughs> forever. <laughs> but I could listen forever. It was well, great. Thank you very much. And thanks to all of you for joining us this evening. Bye-bye. <laughs>